Good morning and welcome again to Greenfield in the Diaspora. Diaspora, which literally means the people scattered from their homeland. Uh, this morning as we're beginning worship, uh, two quick reminders. First of all, I invite you to join us at coffee hour at 11 o'clock. We'll be having a Zoom coffee hour. So great to be able to see familiar faces and just catch up with one another online. And then next Sunday, the 19th, I want to invite you to our first ever drive-in worship service. It will be over at the parking lot behind Cana Lutheran. That's the high school parking lot. You'll be able to drive in and worship safely in your own car. We're going to email out a copy of the worship service so you'll be able to have that on your phone. Um, that service will be at 10 o'clock next Sunday. There will also be an online worship service. That will begin at 9 o'clock. So if you can't drive in, do tune in. We begin our worship this morning with the wonderful words from the psalmist who writes, Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name, for the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Let us worship the Lord. Over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at some of Jesus' wonderful stories. And so this morning, I want to introduce you to Brian McLaren, a wonderful author and speaker, who's going to give us an introduction to the kingdom of heaven. Listen to Brian. You know, uh, a lot of us think that the purpose Jesus came was to try to help us get to heaven after we die. Well, I'd like to raise some serious questions about that based on the New Testament. I'd like to suggest Jesus didn't come here to tell us how to get to heaven after we die primarily. He came to talk to us about how the kingdom of heaven can happen here on earth while we're here and when our children and our grandchildren are here. Uh, maybe what we should do is we should get Jesus to uh, edit the Lord's Prayer. So we should edit the Lord's Prayer to sound more like the way we think. It should say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. May we go to heaven after we die. May we leave here and go to your kingdom in heaven 
which is unlike earth because there your will is done. But that's not what the, the Lord's Prayer says. It says, may your kingdom come here. May your will be done down here on earth as it is in heaven. Very different understanding of what Jesus is about when we see his message centered on the kingdom. But what does that mean? What does the kingdom of God mean? Well, it, it changes the way you look at people who are different. You stop rich, look at the poor in a different way. The poor look at the rich in a different way. Uh, people look at people of other races and other religions in a different way. You can't look at someone of a different political party the same way and be, be faithful to the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God makes you look at creation in a different way. You look at the trees and the sky and the air and the water in a different way. This is now my father's world. It's my father's uh, beautiful artwork that I, it's not just natural resources for me to make a buck off of. If you're taking the kingdom of God seriously, you look at peace and reconciliation and conflict and war in a very different way. Uh, it's easy if you're in the kingdoms of this world to bomb people and kill people and uh, throw them in prison and throw away the key. If you're part of the kingdom of God, you can't treat other people that way. You have to look at it from a new perspective, a new point of view, higher point of view. Jesus said things like, if you give a cup of cold water to somebody in my name, if you see someone who's in prison and you go to visit them, if you see someone who's naked and you give them clothing, if you welcome a little child, you know, in those moments, God's will is being done on earth because God cares about that little child and God cares about that forgotten person in prison. When somebody loves their enemy, they're living by the way of the kingdom. In, on the human level, people see an enemy and they hate them. You love your friends, you hate your enemies. But when people love their enemies, they're manifesting the kingdom of God. When rich people decide that they're not going to use their wealth and power to keep aggrandizing themselves and improving their own portfolio, but when they reach a point they say, gosh, I have enough and there are people in such need. Now I'm going to use my money and my time and my energy and my voice and my vote on behalf of people who are suffering and poor and oppressed and forgotten. At that point, I'm not just a citizen of this world. At that point, I'm acting as a citizen of God's kingdom. I'm living out the way and the teaching and the example of Jesus. Those are some of the things, some of the ways the kingdom of God is a liberating and yet disturbing uh, message for people today. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew, chapter 13, verses 44 through 50. Hear the word of God. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and God's Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. In spite of all that is going on in our world these days, the truth is ours is still a many-splendored universe. Or to use the Chinese metaphor, it's a world of 10,000 things. <laughs> 
which means quite practically that we are faced with a myriad of options in every direction. We are constantly having to make value judgments. The late Carl R. Marnie was fond of saying, there is really no agony in life worse than the moment that you realize I've paid too much. That is, I look at what I have, I look at what it took to get it, and I realize the incredible disparity between those two. And at that point, a profound sense of disappointment comes over us. Uh, I would be surprised, in all honesty, if, if, there, is, if there is an adult among us uh, who is a stranger to that kind of experience. So we have no more fundamental task than facing up to this variety of options and having to decide what is worth what. On the one hand, of course, we can pay too much. We confuse something that is of relative value with something that is of absolute value. On the other hand, um, we can uh, choose something that is of absolute value and we can organize our life around those choices, which I think is exactly what Jesus was pointing to in our three parables this morning. So he chooses to use images that were familiar to his hearings. There was not a peasant alive at that time who would have had trouble understanding Jesus' stories this morning. So the first of those images, the discovery of buried treasure, was not as unusual as you might think. Many a farmer had had the experience of plowing their land and discovering a box or a chest filled with coins or trinkets. Remember that for centuries, invading armies had come through Israel's land. It's the bridge between three different continents. So the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, and then the Romans had all taken turns occupying the Holy Land. People who lived through those invasions soon learned that the earth was the only safe place where they could store their possessions. So when word got out that another foreign army was approaching, the soil of Israel became pockets where they stashed their treasure. Of course, the people who took those precautions uh, were sometimes killed by those invaders. And the treasure was then left in the earth only to be discovered later, quite accidentally, by somebody else. So many of Jesus' listeners would have been familiar with those kinds of stories. The second of Jesus' images uh, focuses on the particular jewel that was most valued in the first century. So diamonds had been discovered, but they were so rare that they really didn't play much part in Mediterranean culture. The pearl was preeminent. It's said that Cleopatra, the queen of the Nile, had several of them. One of them valued at over $3 million in our current currency. Now, as you know, the pearl uh, is, is very different in its origin from other precious stones. A pearl develops when a grain of sand finds its way into the shell of an oyster and then cuts that tender membrane to the quick. In reaction to that intrusion, the little organism secretes this milky substance that softens the sharp edges around that particle of sand. In due time, someone comes along and finds the shell, opens it up, and discovers a precious pearl, a monument, if you will, to the whole process of pain. So it's not surprising why the ancient world valued the pearl as a symbol of hope, a reminder that even bad things can give birth to surprisingly good things. And that's an image that was not lost on our biblical writers. You'll remember in the last book of the Bible, the Revelation to John, he describes heaven, and the entranceway is called the pearly gates. Why? 
because we are reminded as we enter that we do so only because of the created suffering of a God who genuinely cares, of a Savior who came to die on our behalf. So in Jesus' story, a tradesman, a well-trained eye, recognizes the most exquisite of all pearls, and he responds accordingly. The third of Jesus' images grew out of the work of fishermen. Again, no surprise to the people who lived around the Sea of Galilee. And these folks, on a daily basis, would take two boats out. They would row to a particular part of the lake. They would drop their nets between the boats and then slowly row towards the shore. When they got close to the banks, uh, they would drag those nets up on shore and would literally sit there and sort out those that were edible and sellable from those that needed to be thrown back. So all three of these have a common theme, the task of discerning what is worth what. How can we avoid paying too much for something? And on the other hand, how can we find the true summum bonum, the value above all values? In a little book called Flux and Fidelity, Kyle Hazelton says that we human beings differ widely across the ages, but there are two basic drives that remain constant for all of us. One of those, of course, is self-preservation. Uh, a healthy person wants to live on. The other is yearning to fulfill ourselves, to actualize our potential. But Notice that in both of these cases, it is absolutely crucial to be able to discern the relative value of things. In other words, when the summum bonum comes along and is recognized, it changes how we evaluate everything. It is not just another thing on the list. It determines how we prioritize everything on our list in our lives. If you stop and think about it, every experience of change has two different aspects. On the one hand, of course, we get something that we didn't have. On the other hand, we have to give up something that we did have. At the most basic of levels, that's what change does. And in these first two parables, Jesus is saying that healthy change occurs when we discover that the thing that is being offered is greater than the thing that we have to be giving up. But that is by no means all that these parables are meant to teach us. Jesus is returning here to a theme that runs throughout his teachings. He's lifting up for us again uh, the first commandment uh, from the tablets that were given to Moses. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. You shall have no other gods before me. So what is the summum bonum, the value above all values? Jesus called it the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. It is the reality of God's presence in all, God's rule over all. Jesus is so clear. As God's children, we must never expect anything or anyone that derives its life from the creator to be able to satisfy all of our needs. Even the best of things, that is so important to realize that even the best of things, a healthy relationship, a successful career, a loving family, Nothing is able to support the full weight of our expectations. St. Augustine put it this way. He said, Thou hast made us for thyself, O God, and our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. So the kingdom of heaven is to the discerning heart exactly what that buried treasure is to the one who finds it exactly what that exquisite pearl was to the connoisseur. Uh, 
ultimate attachment to anything or anyone is ultimately disappointing and what the Bible calls idolatry. Well, how then do we begin to discern our way into recognizing what is and what is not of ultimate worth? Well, history suggests that most of us do this by trial and error. But years ago, I read a little book by Bernard of Clairvaux. It's called On Loving God. Bernard had spent most of his ministry observing the spiritual growth of hundreds of monks. And he came up with four stages of spiritual development, which have been very helpful to me. And I suspect would be helpful to all of us as we are trying to discern what is really worth what. So Bernard describes stage one as the love of self for self's sake. In reality, this is where we all begin our spiritual journeys. We are aware of our own needs and really nothing else. As we get older, the psychological term for that is narcissism, and it doesn't begin to satisfy us. C.S. Lewis once wrote about being awakened in the middle of the night. This was during his bachelor days and having trouble falling back to sleep. He said it was totally dark and utterly still in his bedroom there at Magdalen College in England. He wasn't able to perceive anything beyond himself. Suddenly, he said, he sat bolt upright in bed because it dawned on him that such isolation was the logical end of a self-centered life. What if, he found himself asking, what if we get in eternity exactly what we have lived for in time? So if we have loved others, if we have given ourselves to causes beyond ourselves, then we will continue to participate in all that kind of richness. But if we have lived only for ourselves, if all of our thoughts and energies revolve around me, could it be that that's all that we will get? We have no choice in beginning our journeys at that stage. We do have a choice as to whether or not we remain there. Now, the second stage is what Bernard calls the love of God for self's sake. Now, notice there is here an awareness that there is something beyond ourselves, but the focus is still very much on me. In other words, I love God, but primarily because of what God can do for me. And Bernard observed that stage two is about as far as most people ever get. They are aware of God, but primarily as a way of fulfilling their own agendas. And this, truth be told, is, is the reality, the theology behind the prosperity gospel. And I think if we're honest, we recognize some of ourselves here as well. I knew a woman years ago who lost her child to a very serious illness. She had tried everything she knew to try to get God to intervene in healing her child. But when that did not occur, uh, she became incredibly bitter. In other words, when she could not get God to jump through her hoops, she promptly broke off diplomatic relations and she became an angry cynic which as often as not is what comes from loving God for self's sake. Because as the scripture teaches us, God's ways are not our ways. God's thoughts are not our own. So although this represents real progress from spiritual narcissism, it too ultimately will not satisfy the needs of our heart. Now, Bernard's third stage, I think, represents a quantum leap forward. He calls it the love of God 
for God's sake. And here we begin to sense that God has value, not just in terms of what God can do for me, but in terms of who God intrinsically is. In other words, there are reasons to worship God that have nothing to do with my own needs. In fact, this is a huge part of what worship is. It's worthship. It's declaring, God, you are worthy of my time and my praise. So I come to worship not just to uh, pick up a message that will be useful to me in the week ahead. I come not just to thank God for what God has done for me. I come to thank God for being God. A friend, a colleague, um, told me a while back about a wonderful memory he has of his little daughter when she was all of four years old. Apparently he was in their den early on a Saturday morning, probably putting the final touches on his sermon, and uh, she slipped in quietly, still in her PJs, and without a word, um, crawled up on his lap and laid her head on his sh shoulder. I'm really glad to see you, he said to her. What, what can I do for you? What, what do you want? She paused for a moment and then said, nothing. I just wanted to be close to you. That's all. Well, you can understand why that image is so precious to him. On the other hand, it pains me to think how rarely I go into the presence of God without any agenda except to say, I just wanted to be with you and thank you for who you are. That's the love of God for God's sake. Now, truth be told, if it were up to me, that's where it would have ended. Love of God for God's sake, that sounds pretty good to me, and it makes for a great three-point sermon. So imagine my shock when Bernard said there was actually a fourth stage, which he calls the love of self for God's sake. And I admit that initially I didn't get it, until later I began to discover the wisdom. So think about it. Who is the most difficult person in the world for you to love, to affirm, and to really celebrate? If your experience is anything like mine, the answer to that question is yourself. How much of our time is spent with thoughts like, well, if only I had different hair, or if only I could lose a little weight, or if only I was in such and such kind of relationship, or if only I had this or that. Thoughts like, if they really knew who I was, they would never. Now, I would like to say that that is just a healthy dose of humility. But the truth is, I think we often don't believe that God really knew what God was doing when God created us. Martin Luther, the great reformer, used to say that whenever he was down on himself, when he was not able to be all he knew that he should be, what saved him was remembering, I am baptized. I have been chosen. I am already loved and forgiven and precious in the eyes of God. So the same words that God spoke over the creation at the beginning of time, God speaks over you. It is good. It is very good. God so loved the world, which means that God so loves you, that he sent his only son. What that means in each of these parables, you see, is that each one of us by virtue of God's amazing grace, is the treasure buried in the field, is the pearl of great price, the valuable fish that should be kept. And so the way to fulfillment lies in affirming, in owning deep down that what God did in creation, what God in, did in creating you was very good. 
in letting that become our joy. Just as surely as the farmer, the merchant, the fishermen found their joy in what they discovered. Here is the summum bonum. In God's eyes, we are, each of us, a treasure, a pearl of great price, a keeper. And in your own eyes this morning, I'm wondering, how do you see yourself? Amen. Let us pray. Oh God, we come on this hot summer morning with so many things on our minds. Some of us have carried heavy loads this week. Some have been troubled about health problems in ourselves or in our loved ones. Some are worried about finances and about how we're going to make things work. Others have been upset about relationships, about parents or children who don't seem to understand, or spouses who no longer seem to care, 
friends who have given little support. Still others have been worried about some of the great metaphysical problems of life. Why is there so much suffering these days? If you are real God, why do you permit so much injustice and unhappiness in the world? Oh God, as we gather this morning, the air is thick with your presence, with your love and care for us. Confident of this, O oh God, help us to relax, to leave our heavy loads with you, you who are able to bear them so much better than we are. Teach us to turn from anxiety and fear to thanksgiving and hope. Show us how to find in each other and give to each other encouragement. We pray this morning for our nation, infected once again with this horrible epidemic, worried about economic downturns, driven apart by political rivalries and by racial differences. We pray for leadership. We pray for courage and patience and for a greater sense of your presence somehow at work in the midst of all of this. Loving one, gather now all of our prayers, spoken and unspoken. Gather them together into the one prayer you taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Go out into the world in peace. Live as free men and women. Serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of God's Spirit among you. As you go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, may the love of God, may the communion of God's Holy Spirit rest upon you, today and forevermore. Amen.